You're listening to NFT 365, the first daily podcast on NFTs with your host, Fanzo. Yes, 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 my friends. Do, do your own do your own damn research. And not only do your own damn research, but let's together, you know, lift each other up, make sure that we are helping each other kind of uh, avoid the negativity and celebrate the positivity um, in this space. You know, I am a big believer in that, you know, the way that we make uh, the world a better place is we stop giving attention to a lot of the bad and a lot of the negative, and we start amplifying a lot of the good and a lot of the amazing things that happen uh, around us. And I will tell you, we are we are blessed with a, a treat today for um, our guest on our podcast. Um, and I will tell you, you know, I do a lot of research for uh, NFTs. Uh, of course, we're buying an NFT every single day for a year here uh, with the podcast. But, uh, you know, those that don't know, you know, I probably do more research on the guests for our podcast than I do even for NFTs. And it's partially because I just love and feel so honored to be able to interview people, to be able to, you know, really share their amazing stories with the world. And, you know, I do that as a, as a full-time keynote speaker with the stories I tell on stages, you know, as a host and MC, I've been able to do that with some amazing events, you know, such as like Dell, uh, technology world. I've been able to do that with startups and, and different brands are around the world. And and I will tell you, you know, our guest today, um, Matt, who will be well introduced in a second. Um, the more I research, the more I kind of dove into not only his story but uh, the impact he's made um, in so many different ways. I will say, the more I got inspired, the more I probably got emotional. Um, and I and I'll say probably. Um, most of you know, you know, I get emotional watching Undercover Boss, the TV show, when you know they award all of these amazing employees with things. Like I start bawling. Uh, just it's just who I am. I, I own that. And you know, even this morning, uh, going back through some of the the things that Matt has done, uh, it definitely had me emotional. So you're in for a treat because not only does uh, is it going to be a great interview and get to learn a lot about Matt's story, but Matt is leaving his. Uh, one world and kind of coming full time into our world of NFTs. And he's actually been in the NFT space longer than we have, longer than I have. Um, but now he gets to do that full time. So uh, without further ado, the newly retired, uh, we're not going to say who who retired you first or anything, because that would just be awkward. Uh, but the newly retired uh, Major League Baseball and World Series champion, Matt Caesar. Matt, welcome to NFT 365. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Banzo. That was a heck of an intro, man. I really appreciate that. Sounds like you did some serious research. I did, my friend. I did. And you are a pretty damn amazing human. I, I can say, I think if I had to sum up like my feeling after you know doing the research is I, I just had a feeling like I want to be your best friend, right? Like I want to be in your circle, in your sphere, because you know, a lot of the things, and I, and I remember for those, you know, we'll kind of set the stage and then I'll um, get into these questions. You know, I remember watching uh, the E60 uh, you know, spot on you when it, when it first came out. And I'm addicted to documentaries, of course, massive passion and love uh, for sports. And so I've watched every E60, you know, as they came out. And I remember your story. I remember watching that and just being um, amazed. But going back now and getting to know you through um, not only Drew and, and some of the NFT stuff that we've been talking about, and, and we'll, we'll share some of the things with Meta Athletes as well. But going back and watching it again today, it was, it was even more inspiring and more you know, kind of connected the dots. And I think it also connects to some of the things that you want to do in the future. But before we get all that, give us – so you retired um, just this week, right? So how, how are you feeling right now at this moment? Are you feel complete? I know retirement is such a, is such a big thing, especially for athletes that have spent their whole lives uh, in the sports. How are you feeling at the moment? Dude, I, I'm going to be completely honest with you. You know, I, I feel like I'm I'm probably the happiest I've been in a long time. Um, you know, the past couple of years, my body's been been pretty shot, and I feel like you know, not only was I trying to go compete with guys, you know, throwing 95 to 100, but you know, I was competing with staying healthy on the field, and I feel like that was uh, that was tougher for me mentally than it was physically because it was like you know, every day I was going out to the field and. You know, I wasn't taking as many swings as I wanted to. I was just trying to like survive, and that's that's really not what I wanted to do. I wanted to go out there and, and play baseball, like you know, I I grew up playing like a kid. You know, I wanted to go steal bases and I wanted to, you know, swing for the fences. And I feel like I was playing, 
not necessarily timid, but you know, I wasn't able to to practice like I I used to. So, so I feel like mentally it was it was just super draining, and and now like you know, without having that stress of you know going into spring training, get hurt, you know, messing up my quad, my oblique, you know, I'm 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 just in a in a much better place. You know, I'm able to to be a husband and a father and a son, and you know, it's just it's just a really good feeling. I love, I love baseball to death. I love um, everything that it's done and, and has given to me, but you know, it's definitely time to, to turn the page and, and move on to the next chapter for sure. I love that, man. And, and congrats to you uh, on that and that feeling. And I think, you know, we can feel that even in, in your share there. So, you know, I appreciate that. Um, you know, it's, we, we, we kind of covered now, so we're going to, we're going to go back, you know, um, you know, your, you know, early, you know, growing up, um, you know, no question. I, you know, I think your, your athletic, um, you know, prowess, I think has been documented pretty well online in the sense that, you know, you were, you know, a two sport athlete with football and baseball. Uh, I believe chose, you know, chose Villanova because they were going to allow you to play both those sports. But I want to go before those days, you know, like I, I believe I read that your, your dad inspired you to draw. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, I, I just think it's amazing as someone that, you know, is committed to the athletics and, and where you went with athletics that you're kind of like your, you know, kind of, I guess, you know, attachment to art and drawing and your creativity was born young and kind of continued on while also kind of chasing your passion. So talk to us a little bit about how that all became kind of started for you as kind of your love for, you know, the artistic side. Yeah. I mean, I, I've really been doing it my whole life. Um, you know, as long as I, I can remember, I remember just kind of sitting next to my dad as he would draw or sketch or paint or, or do whatever he did. Um, he's, you know, super creative and he used to just have side hustles and one of his side hustles, he was, he w- would make fishing lures. And, you know, I, I can remember, you know, wrapping these lures with, you know, feathers and felt and, and doing whatever for my dad with my dad. And I just feel like that kind of opened up my you know, creativity. And, and it's the same thing I do with my son. You know, I, I painted a, a huge chalkboard in my basement so that he can just grab chalk whenever he wants and just scribble all over the walls just to kind of, kind of get that creativity flowing. And, you know, I really, my whole life all throughout school was always in art class. You know, I, I studied art in college and, you know, for me, it was the easiest way to kind of get away from, you know, an O for five day or, you know, a, a two or three punch out day. It was, was able to, you know, come home and decompress and just kind of start drawing on my iPad. And, and it turned out to, to be, you know, a, a side hustle, you know, kind of a second, second hobby. And it was super therapeutic for me to just kind of just get away from, from the game. And, you know, I just kind of continued that passion and ended up turning into a, a job. And now it's a full-time job. I, I think that's so, I mean, I think it's so powerful and I'm guessing your, you know, your ability to do that as like the idea that, you know, you aren't, you know, going to be defined by just the, the athletic side of the house. Where does that come from? Is that from your parents that, that kind of gave you that ability to, you know, be comfortable there? Because I think that's such a hard thing. You know, I'm a, I'm a dad as well of three girls and, you know, and I think it's a, it's a beautiful, you know, aspiration to have them to, you know, chase their dreams, dreams while also being, you know, kind of committed to the things that they love. But I think it's kind of hard to kind of feel that, especially with, you know, yourself as you were becoming, you know, more, you know, known for your athletics. Like what, what was, you know, is it your parents' commitment to like, hey, you can stay grounded, you can stay committed to these things? Talk to us a little bit about that. I mean, yeah, they, they always told me to, to do whatever I wanted to do. You know, it wasn't, wasn't like, you know, my dad was, beat me into the ground, making me run the, run the bleachers or, you know, hit a thousand balls. It's, it's everything that I wanted to do. And, and he just kind of both of them, you know, they just kind of pushed to, you know, pretty much be the best that I could be at whatever I was doing. And if I was going to start something to, to not do it half ass. So I always kind of took that and, and wanted to be the best in everything I did. And, and, you know, maybe I fell short a couple of times, but you know, at the end of the day, it, it made me pretty successful just to, to try and like, you know, be the best because, you know, falling short of the best is second, third, fourth place. And, you know, that's, that's not, that's not too shabby. Yeah, <laughs> that's so true. I'm curious, you know, as, you know, through school and then you're, you know, before you went to uh, Villanova and kind of selected, you know, the, the school that allowed you to play two sports, you know, what, when you kind of pictured like, you know, what you wanted to be when you grew up, was there, 
one sport that you kind of like pictures yourself more in than the other? Or like, what, what did you kind of view would be the, the life after uh, college? Or were you thinking, you know, Bo Jackson style going and playing on both sides? No, man, I, I never, you know, I was drafted out of high school for baseball, but you know, it was in the 38th round and I really had no, uh, you know, like I said, I wanted to be the best, but I didn't really think I was going to go pro in either sport. Um, until like my sophomore junior year, I was like, dang, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm pretty decent at these, these sports. Like, you know, maybe I have a shot here, but it wasn't like, you know, I was going to college to, you know, be a professional athlete. I was going to college to get a good degree from, you know, a really prestigious school and, and to try and network as much as possible. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And, and like I said, you know, I just, I wanted to be the best and, and, you know, I wanted to, to give a hundred percent and no matter what I did, you know, I was always, always had a 3.0 and, and, you know, always, you know, gave my, gave my all in baseball and football. And it, like I said, it turned out to be all right. Yeah, definitely, definitely turned out to be all right. And, you know, during that time, so that was, you know, during the, the, you know, went to uh, Villanova and, um, I believe, you know, based on the, the E60, you know, documentary, um, that was the time that you kind of uh, went and signed up on, on the Bo Marrow list. And was that something, had you, you know, been volunteering or kind of getting involved in local charities and things beforehand? Talk to us a little bit about like, how did that come to life on kind of uh, putting yourself on that donor list? And, and like, you know, was that was that something that was natural or kind of spur of the moment? Give us a little bit of that. So... Um... The head, the head football coach I don't know at the time was his name is Andy Talley and he runs you know it's called getting game and what he does is he travels to all you know all these colleges all over the country to to kind of promote joining the bone marrow registries you know he figured hey listen we have you know 70 80 really healthy guys like let's get them to join the registry and see if we can save some lives so you know as as a freshman you know you have the opportunity to to join the registry or not and you know obviously i chose to join the registry and then my junior year i got called to donate and you know it was a a pretty much a no-brainer man it's it's kind of a touchy subject now because obviously the the family that i donated to the little girl i donated to is in the ukraine and you know they i've been really in contact with them every pretty much every other day i don't want to kind of like beat them down with questions but you know they they finally got to the border and and they're in poland as refugees but you know it it just breaks my heart watching watching tv and seeing that kind of stuff little girls you know 13 she's either 13 or 14 years old right now and, and she's got a little brother and they have you know obviously the mom and dad but you know it's just it's a tough subject you know it stinks yeah and our you know our heart goes out to all of those um in ukraine that are, are impacted there and and you know and not only you know are they now refugees in, in poland but you know, from the documentary, we learned that, you know, this is the second time now as they were forced to be uh, refugees, you know, previously. And and you kind of lost touch with them, you know, through that period as well. And then we're able to kind of bring that around. And I, I will just say like the, you know, seeing you introduce uh, your your wife to, to her and your and your dad and like seeing that connection that you had with someone that, you know, you donated. And, and I know you mentioned, you know, it was a no brainer. Uh, to say yes, you know, to to you know, to you know, give your bone marrow. Uh, I think that's that's easily said as the person that did it. I think that is, you know, there's a lot of us that would we could you know visualize ourselves in that position. And I don't know if all of us we would like to believe that we would say yes. Hey, we we had we did the cheek swab. We we signed up, and now that we you know got called, we will do it. But I mean, I think it's you know it's a heroic. Uh, thing and I know you won't you won't accept that as that way, but I mean not only the impact you made there, but also I think you know the the you know the kind of demonstration of you know putting others first and even just being able you know committed to being more than just a baseball player. And I just want to say like you know from from all of us that kind of see that from the outside, it's it's beyond inspiring, and I think it's a it's a beautiful piece that kind of continues forward. And you know I'll say like the other part of this I was curious about you know. As you were, you know, I think the you know, the artistic side and the balance with the athletics, you know, I, I read, I think it might have been on your site, but there was, you know, how did the, how did you kind of start leading more or kind of getting back into art and coming, becoming more 
uh, public with your art as your major league baseball kind of career took off because you started off in the minors and were kind of working your way through, um, you know, to the starting lineup. Uh, was the art also kind of like a, a mental health uh, escape then as well? Because I can imagine it being it when you were young, but I, I can't imagine, that, you know, the, the struggles or even on the, the minor league roads on the, on the bus and in those, uh, you know, motels along the way. How did art play a role like uh, as your journey as a, as a major leaguer? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I, I kind of doodled here and there. And, you know, my wife and I were in the process of building a house, you know, when I was in the minor league. So I was always kind of, you know, looking off house plans, designing things here and there. But, you know, I, I really didn't start, I really didn't start drawing, like, you know, just like messing around with stuff until, you know, I got to the big leagues because that, that stage is just, you know, so much bigger. And, you know, you, you go home, whether you're over four or four for four, you're still, you know, stressed for the next day. And it was just a way for me to kind of decompress. And, and, you know, like I said, it, it kind of, my wife and I have a foundation and for one of our, our foundation events, we wanted to, you know, auction off something special. So what I did was, this was in 2015. What I did was, um, I did two self portraits, one of me in a Cubs uniform and another one of me in my villain of football uniform. And, you know, both of them sold for $500 each. And that was in 15 and in 16, we won the world series and the Cubs were like, hey, you know, can you do um, a painting for our Bricks and Ivy Ball, which is like their their big charity uh, fundraiser right in the beginning of the of the season. So I was like, yeah, of course. So I I um, I painted a picture of the World Series and it ended up, you know, raising forty thousand dollars. And I was like, wow, maybe I have something here. So then like those doodles became into more like business minded. And I was like, all right, you know, let me try and figure out how to kind of capitalize on this and, and take advantage of, you know, the artistic ability. So then I just start grinding, man. And then, you know, came out with piece, pieces, sold, you know, four or five, six a year. And then when the last dance documentary came out, I just started grinding on, on MJ paintings. And dude, I, I can't tell you how much I sold. Like, you know, it was like 20, 30 paintings that I was selling and I was just, I was just crushing it. And then, you know, after that, the COVID hit and, um, you know, we were sent home and, and Micah Johnson reached out to me and was like, Hey, you know, you want to sell some NFTs? And I was cracking up at your intro because it's like, you know, WTF, like what's an NFT? And, and dude, that was like my first thought. I never heard of like Ethereum or Bitcoin. I was just kind of oblivious to everything. And we, you know, Mike and I, we did a, um, uh, a piece of George Floyd. It was like the fourth, uh, drop on Nifty Gateway. Micah did one side of his face and I did the other side of his face we did a physical and the nft the physical sold to jason hayward for 10 grand and the digital one sold i think we sold like 80 for you know 200 bucks and they sold you know sold out in less than like five minutes and i turned to my wife and i was like yo we just sold out our nfts and literally like that was her her word she's like you know wtf like nfts i was like i have no idea so then I started really diving into like the NFTs and Ethereum, but Bitcoin, and I was like really picking Micah, Micah's brain and Tommy Wilson's brain as well. And, and I just, you know, just started grinding from there, man. So I have to ask, you know, from a, uh, you know, I am not an artist. I actually consider myself artistically challenged. Um, and in the sense that I can't draw, can't sing, can't dance, can't, uh, you know, though all those mediums are, uh, are a struggle for me. I'm, I'm more of, uh, the entertainment for my daughters when we do, uh, crafts on the weekends is they get, they get to laugh at what daddy produces. And I've always owned that, owned that side. I'm curious, like that creative process, you know, uh, offline with, you know, some of the paintings that you did. And I, I put some of them here in the nest. And for those that are listening on the podcast, I will include them um, in the show notes. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a Pittsburgh guy. And I, I mean, the Michael Jordan documentary and the, uh, the pieces there are amazing, but I did see you had one of my, you know, my, my two favorite, uh, you know, major leaguers were, were Ken Griffey Jr. And uh, Barry Bonds growing up. And I, I saw you had a Ken Griffey Jr. Uh, painting, which I was just mesmerized by. And uh, I, always, I always talk a lot about King Griffey Jr. on here on this podcast because I own uh, you know, about 50 of his rookie cards from, uh, you know, the days of collecting baseball cards. And it's kind of like those early days of NFTs for me. But I, I'm curious from a artistic, like your, like your artistic process, how, how did that kind of exist in the offline space? And how have you kind of like either adapted that into this, this space, because I don't, I don't understand that process a lot. And, you know, our mutual friend of ours, Kevin Smith, who is the you know founder of meta athletes, you know, I'm blown away by his, 
uh, artistic uh, commitment in the stuff, the art that he's working on now. But I, you know, he's also you know a major ligger that's doing that. So give us a little bit of insight into your like creative process. Yeah, I mean, as far as like the physical paintings, I've always um, I've always did stencils. I was always kind of like amazed with you know all these stencil artists and and like the crisp lines and you know how they can make something look so um, realistic, but when you kind of like dive into it, you you see you see that it's not realistic. If that makes sense. So I wanted to do something. I feel like everybody does like super realism. Like they're all you know absolutely incredible it's just like kind of hand painting and i was like how can i be different so you know i just started kind of like messing around with different ideas different stencils and and kind of found something that i liked and that's that's what i do for my my physicals and then you know for my digitals like i, I paint the skeleton and the skull to reference uh the bone marrow donation so every time somebody's like hey you know why do you paint the skeleton you know, I'm able to be like, well, listen, I donated to bone marrow. How about you join the registry? Here's the link, you know, click the link. And all you, all you got to do is sign up. They send you, um, you know, a test kit, you do cheek swabs and you send it back in and, you know, right then and there, they, you know, have the opportunity to, to help save someone's life or, you know, vice versa. So, so for me, it was like, you know, I, I wanted to find something. I feel like a lot of these guys that are on the digital space, they have kind of like their niche and they, they have like a character, they have a story. And, you know, one of the things I, I tweeted out today was true sales. And, and for me, like, you know, I didn't start really selling, selling stuff on like as NFTs until I started like sharing my story, you know, and, and that, that was like huge for me because as an athlete, you don't, you don't really want to like let those walls down. If that makes sense. Like you don't want to be, at least for me, like I didn't want to be looked at as like a soft, a soft athlete. Cause I was out there painting and I was like, you know what? Fuck this. Like I'm, I'm just going to do it and, and kind of like let my walls down and be like, be vulnerable. And the second I was vulnerable, bro, like, you know, you can look on my super rare. It's, it, it, you know, I have, pieces that sold for you know 300 400 800 dollars and then once i start painting skeleton sharing story and being vulnerable like as an athlete you know my my prices went from like you know 5k 10k 15 20 and and my highest was you know recently but that was a collab my highest before that was you know forty two thousand dollars and and i think that's that's by that's from being like being truthful you know selling the truth and and you know being vulnerable in in the this, this space so i'm curious i i was going to go there and you went there for me which makes that it makes it really easy on my side and and i did see your you know you did have a home run king uh Barry Bonds uh one that i uh i did like that was up there uh and i i have a fond memory i, I happen to be uh, Barry Bonds took me on the field during a, a rain delay his rookie year in Pittsburgh. I was born and raised there. Uh, and there's a picture of him rolling a baseball to me. And so I, I have a, a fond uh, memory and uh, I've supported uh, Barry Bonds throughout the <laughs> throughout that journey. And and I love that you you know, kind of tied in like the story part and the vulnerability part. And I'm curious from, you know, you know, there's a lot of artists that are listening to our podcast. And, you know, I often struggle be, because, you know, I do believe that, you know, we have to work hard to remove kind of that starving from the starving artist. And we have to not only be able to support artists, but also see the value in the art for, for what it is, the art. But I also know that there's a lot of artists that feel kind of like the pressure of having to just deliver some kind of utility or some kind of discord or some kind of something just because it seems to be kind of like demanded or there seems to be like that pressure. I, I would, I, this is my own thoughts is I actually believe the, the ability to tell the story and that vulnerability actually, you know, kind of mitigate that need for that utility. Cause now it kind of lets people in, but I'm, I'm curious your take on that. Like as you lean in and the more, you know, I'm sure not only are, are other NFT artists, you know, looking up to you, but there's other, you know, athletes that are wondering like, how do I, how do I enter this space? And like, as my true self and not be looked at as a money grab or even fall, you know, victim to a lot of, you know, there are celebrities and athletes that are, are going about this kind of the incorrect way. What would you say to those artists that, you know, felt that pressure for utility, but you really just want to do what they do best and that's create. Yeah. I mean, I, I felt that pressure and, and not, I don't really feel that pressure anymore just because I feel like I've, I've kind of made a name for myself as being an artist and, you know, I, I feel like I started from the bottom, like, you know, yeah, I was an athlete and, 
but people didn't buy my stuff because I was an athlete. You know, maybe it helped a little bit with, with the following, but like I said, dude, I was low man on the totem pole selling for, for cheap. And, and I like grinded, man. I, I, I put a hundred percent into this space every day and, and, you know, I put a hundred percent into my art every day. And, and I think, you know, it, it kind of shows, but you know, like it's, it's tough to, to see that, you know, I don't, I don't want to be categories categorized in that kind of, that kind of, I guess, light. Um, and I don't think I am just because of the, the, you know, I've been in the space for almost two years or maybe a little bit over two years. And, you know, I, I think the biggest thing is, you know, just, just showing that you kind of respect everybody else and, and you're not in it for a cash grab. And, and I think that's what the meta athletes guys are doing really well is like, you know, they, they had the ability to just kind of put something out and mint right away, but you know, they're building organically. And I, and I think that's, that is, is exactly how I tried to build. You know, I wasn't, I'm, my stuff is still pretty scarce. You know, I wasn't, you know, putting out a bunch of additions. I don't even think I have any additions yet. Um, and I, I just tried to go about it the right way. I tried to network, I tried to, to offer help. And, and I think that was more my utility than, you know, promising, you know, anything like a bunch of airdrops or, or, or whatever. I think me being willing to help others just as much as they're willing to help me is, is kind of what, what brought me and, and what made me kind of successful. Well, I mean, I will tell you from, um, you know, from the, the, the side, you know, from this side and, you know, the more people, you know, that I talk to and the more that like your name would come up in conversations, you know, your, your reputation, uh, not only in like for, you know, supporting other NFT artists, but also kind of walking the walk and, and being an artist that others can, you know, be aligned with is something that I heard, uh, across the board from, you know, artists that are in the space from, you know, actually we had, we had, um, one of the animators, um, Brian Brinkman was on the podcast earlier, uh, this season. And when I uh, was actually messaging him the other day and he actually brought your name up and, and mentioned that, uh, he, he's like, I think I saw that you were, uh, going to have, uh, Matt on, or you were interacting with Matt. And so I think like, you know, I, I will say that from our, from the, this side, that's something that I, that I hear a lot. I'm curious, you know, from, a um, you know, the, you've been in the space for like two years years there's you know it's definitely evolves you know it's why we're doing a daily podcast because i didn't think uh we had the things changed so quickly that there was doing a weekly podcast would just be it would have to be a five-hour show just to uh capture what goes on but like what how, how have how have you seen it evolve from like an artist perspective and and what are some of the things like along the way that have you know excited you and and probably even now exciting even more that you can kind of lean in full time yeah i mean dude Brinkman was was one of the first guys that I've I've met in space and and he helped me out tremendously. Like helped me learn he learned you know, he taught me how to mint, he taught me how to animate, you know, he would always like you know, and and that's what I'm saying, man. Like I, I came in space and I was willing to help and I feel like people saw that whether, you know, what I could help these people with or not, you know, these guys are so much better than I was. But, you know, I always offered to like, hey, listen, if you need anything you know, please don't hesitate to ask. I'll, I'll try and whatever. And, and Brian was like one of those first guys that, that really showed me like, you know, this isn't like me versus you. This is like us and we're trying to win together and we're trying to put like NFTs on the map. And I, and I think that was huge, man. Like, you know, there's the way I look at it, there's a piece of the pie for everybody. You know, if you're, the internet is so big and there's so many people on this internet that, you know, we really shouldn't be com- competing with each other. Maybe, maybe compete with each other for you know a friendly competition just to just to keep grinding and and you know inspire other people. But you know, I, I feel like one of the, the and this was a such a cliche thing to say all the time early on. You know, everybody made fun of it. Was like community, community, community. But you know, at the end of the day, I haven't really been part of a community other than like you know the World Series team that was like and, and my national championship team, my football team that was willing to like help. And, you know, it was just, it was just so, you know, organic and so, you know, friendly and, and friendly competition that it was crazy. And I, and I just love being in the community and that's, that's really what, what kind of drove me to, to grind in this space so much is because everybody was willing to help. 
so I'm curious, and I, I love that, and I love the connection to uh, to Brian, and I'll I include his uh, the link for his episode here in the uh, the show notes that want those that want to jump back in and listen to that as uh, Brian has been an animator on like the late night show Saturday Night Live, uh, as well as all kinds of other uh, amazing uh, you know places here that you know kind of show up as artists, and you know I it's you know it's interesting. I was thinking back, you know we're you know, this space, I'm, you know, very blessed the doors that this space has opened. And, you know, it's kind of wild. You're the, you're the third athlete um, that we've, you know, interviewed here on the podcast. Uh, we also have uh, Meta World Peace will be uh, on the podcast uh, over the next couple of days as well as, uh, you know, here sharing. And, and I think part of it to me, you know, from a standpoint of, you know, an athlete, you know, kind of, you know, being in the NFT space is, you know, it also gets to show, kind of your complete self and you know the impact and the things that you've wor- you're working on and and you mentioned that you were you know you've done art for you know your foundation um, you've worked on, on things around there talk to us a little bit about the foundation and have you a- entered into the idea of like what you know what role nfts could play in uh, you know the foundation as kind of like moving forward uh, I mean not really man I feel like I've just been so focused on you know building myself up and building my community and my followers up and being organic and just kind of like going about things the right way as an artist. I think once that happens, you know, I'll be able to, to kind of really run with that. You know, I did something for Darren Ravel. Um, he has a foundation and I came out with a piece. Um, it's called fighting my demons. I don't know if you can find them. Um, keyboard monkey actually is the one who collected it and it was in February and it was mental, mental health awareness month. And, you know, for me, it, it depicts, um, like me battling my demons. And, and, you know, like I said, I was never really battling, up people. you know, I was never really competing against the pitcher or anybody else. I feel like I was myself all the time to try and stay healthy. And, and it was like, it was more, way more mental than it was physical. You know, it was just, it was just a terrible feeling. And, you know, I, I hope no one has to go through it, but you know, I'm, I'm sure plenty of people do. Um, so I, I created a piece of like, you know, what helps me fight my demons. And, you know, I painted it like a, a skull and, and the skull had his head open. It's, you know, it's not graphic, but in, in the head and the mental aspect, it was, you know, a skeleton painting his family. And that, that to me was like the biggest thing. Like that's, that's how I got away from that like mental mental pressure or anxiety was was being with my family and painting so that you know as far as foundation goes like that's what i did that we did on a part of the proceeds went to his foundation to to kind of help with mental awareness and you know I, I obviously thought about doing some stuff for myself but um not as much we did we did our nifty gateway drop we did a, a percentage for that for my foundation um we dominated that um, but as far as like, you know, doing one-on-ones or it wasn't, wasn't too, I haven't really thought about it too much. Just the, the foundation aspect, the Nifty Gateway, and also like, you know, including links to, to join the Bone Marrow Registry. Um, did pretty well with that. Well, talk to us a little bit about the, the Bone Marrow Registry. I, I feel, you know, I, you know, hearing your story and then you kind of, you know, thinking about it and realizing, I don't think we, many of us know, uh, you know, much about like what that process is and, and what, it, you know, what all goes through there. And, you know, the fact that you are not only an advocate, but, you know, you paused your, you know, collegiate career to, you know, at the time save a, a stranger who now, you know, we've learned is, you know, in, uh, you know, a young girl in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, talk to us a little bit about uh, what does that, what does that all look like and, and you know, how can we get involved? Yeah, I mean it's it's pretty simple, man. I I think you can um, you can go to my website, Matt, and there's you know a link to join the Bone Marrow Registry, be the match dot com, and join the Bone Marrow Registry there. And and it's, dude, it's pretty simple. Like I said, all you do is you sign up, and they send you like a test kit, and it's like a cheek swab. You do um, four cheek swabs, and it's just like a Q tip, and you swab like the right corner, the left corner the bottom left corner, the bottom right corner, and you send it back in. And like I said, it's super simple because they, they mail everything. You go to somewhere to join the registry and you send it back in and you kind of, you know, you hope for I me, mean, don't hope for it, but you know, you, you want the opportunity to save some life. So, but yeah, and it's, and like, you know, when I donated there two procedures, one procedure is through the hip, but they put you to sleep, you're under anesthesia. And then, 
the one I did is a stem cell procedure where they uh, put a needle in your arm, they take the blood out, they filter it through a machine, and then they put a needle in your other arm and it just goes right back in. Wow. Um, and, and it, it does sound simple, yet I feel that you know, even though it's simple, the, the fact that so many of us you know, haven't done it or aren't aware of it um, I think is, you know, just a more example of our, our need and desire to, you know, make that happen. And, you know, I, I talked to Drew, um, prior to this and I said, I told Drew, I was like, Drew, we just have to, to, to make it happen. But I didn't understand. I thought we had, it might have had to go somewhere, um, you know, to make that happen. So I'm going to include, uh, the link to the foundation, uh, in the, in the show notes of the, of the podcast. And I, I wanted to, you know, for those that are listeners, of the podcast, most of you know that uh, the podcast is uh, super powered uh, by the ADHD coin over on Rally. So it's a, a creator coin that I was lucky enough to actually. Uh, it, it came, you know, I, I got approved for it actually yesterday, a year ago. So a year ago, 366 days ago, um, the the coin kind of came to fruition. Of course, the coin is ADHD coin because of uh, you know my ADHD and and kind of the my commitment to the the mental health side of the house, which. Wow. Talking about irony. <laughs> so my alarm just went off. I think you guys might be able to hear that. It is 1.40 p.m. And if anyone knows what 1.40 p.m. is in my life, it is time for my second dose of Adderall. So that is uh, and I, I say that because I, I try to remove the, the stigma around medication as well. Um, and that was not planned. I can pr- promise you that at all. Um, but what I wanted to do for the listeners, you know, I think, it, you know, that, that's, you know, I think we can all you know, take uh, Matt's lead and, you know, check out how, you know, to go through the process of, you know, getting our cheeks swabbed and signing up for the registry. And so anyone that's in our community, anyone that's listening to the podcast, if you go through that process and you send your swabs in and you uh, post the, we're, we're going to set up a little thing in the discord. If you post your confirmation uh, receipt in our discord, I'm going to, I'm going to gift you 11 ADHD coin uh, for each person that, that, you know, kind of takes that on. So I think, you know, we can all you know, talk about, uh, you know, making an impact. We can all, uh, you know, do our, our own role. And for me, that's the beauty of this coin is that I can uh, hopefully reward, incentivize, and celebrate. So uh, make sure I'll put the, the show, put that here in the show notes, and uh, I'll honor that all the way up until uh, November 11th of this year for the first one of the of the podcast of the of the whole season. So for anyone that wants to do that, just jump over uh, discordgg coin. I'll put that in the show notes as well. Um, and let's let's get more people on that registry. I know I will. I'll be taking care of signing up and getting that uh, today. And and I'll we'll we'll do some documentation on it so people are, are aware of like kind of what what we had to do to, on our side but you know Matt you're you're an inspiration in that way man and uh, I, you know I want to thank you for kind of bringing that to light for for so many of us and uh, we'll we'll do our best to kind of spread the word and, and hopefully you know increase awareness around that appreciate that fanzo yeah, and like I said you know I, I had a drip drop on nifty gateway that you know highlighted the whole story um, I don't know if you can put a link to that uh, I did you know obviously me donating, I did me finding the match. You know, there, there's four pieces on there. They're, uh, I'm sure they're available in the secondary market. And you know what I did was after the, the final sale, I donated a percentage to my foundation where, you know, we raise awareness for bone marrow, obviously. And we, you know, donate back to the community, whether it's food or toys around Christmas time, we just try and take care of, uh, take care of the local community and, and also help with like, you know, cancer needs, um, I've done art like prints for for families and stuff, so so it all goes to a good cause. So I, I did find that I I I was you were testing my my Googling skills, uh, but I just uh, I tweeted it out and I, I pinned it up there above uh, our heads, and it's also uh, in the show notes here uh, for the podcast. So Matt, you know, as you look, um, you know, there's a couple of things I wanted to you know just kind of tap into your experience. You know, as an athlete, as now you know, as a successful NFT artist. I'm sure you're getting, you know, kind of bombarded uh, with, you know, opportunities to partner, opportunities to promote, opportunities to, um, you know, shill. <laughs> let's let's face it, we know how this space goes. What is your filter like? How are you filtering kind of the noise of opportunities that are coming in, and and how are you approaching kind of like partnerships? Uh, I think the biggest thing for me is like, you know, someone being authentic or you know, organic. You know, I'm I'm big into like building and like i said you know, I, I even though i was an athlete and had a following you know my following wasn't art based it was you know baseball football athlete based so i feel like for me like i really had to work at networking with artists with collectors and 
and I had to build, man. I, I freaking grind it every day and I still grind, you know, I'm, I'm still, I'm still trying to be the best. I'm still trying to like, you know, be a your artist. And, and the only way for me to do that is to, to continue to continue to grind. So, you know, the, the people that I, I like to partner with are, are those kind of people, you know, like people that I can do research on and, and know that they're going to grind and they're not in cash grab. I feel like I could have very easily done a cash grab, you know, opportunity and i chose to to kind of build it organically and and do it the right way so you know when i partner with somebody um that's that's what i'm looking for i'm not looking for the cash grabs i'm not not looking somebody who's gonna like pump and dump and and, uh i'm just i've I've done the right thing my whole life and i don't plan on not doing that now (laughs) (laughs) well i I think that's the that is the lesson, right? I think there's also that idea of like, you know, not only do we have, you know, something to lose, but, you know, I, I, I feel like I say it a lot, but, you know, there is no, you know, one project, no one opportunity that we is worth jeopardizing, you know, the trust and the reputation that we all have. And, uh, and I will say, you know, I, I couldn't, ever, you know, I couldn't play in the major, major leagues uh, with you or, you know, join those teams. But I am excited that, uh, you know, we had, I think the, the news was broken a little earlier today. Um, and for a change, I didn't break that person's news. And I, I guess I, I have to formally apologize to you, Matt, on, on the podcast, because for those that don't know, like, I was super excited to have Matt on the podcast. We had actually talked about having him on uh, a couple months back. And it was like, well, let me wait till this other big announcement happens. Happens, and then um, we'll we'll make this happen, and uh, you can say we were excited to make it happen. And when I found out um, that Matt was going to drop the, the the news, I, you know, I got the link. I was checking out, you know, what the the announcement was, and I uh, I will say I put uh, my foot in my mouth. I put uh, my tweet in my mouth as uh, I got excited and celebrated Matt with a tweet saying, "Congratulations on retirement. Welcome to the NFT artist community." Uh, without realizing that he hadn't tweeted it out yet. Um, and man, did I feel like a, a complete jerk. And I, I, I apologize for that, Matt. I, I, it was definitely uh, my own fault. I'm usually really good at going to check it, the person's profile to see if they had, uh, they had put it out there to the world. But I appreciate you not you know, holding it against me too bad and still coming here um, on the podcast as well. But uh, we, we tweeted out, I know, out of the Meta Athletes account that uh, you've, you've joined on to our team here with uh, Meta Athletes uh, as an advisor. So uh, super excited to have you a part of that team if you want to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, like I said, dude, I, I'm, 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 I'm big on people being authentic and, and growing things the right way. And I think you know, I have to talk through and have and Casey and Cody, I feel like they're doing stuff the right way, and that's that's the kind of stuff I'm wanting to be a part of. And not, it's not like they're just the, the thing that I like the most about it is their the utility is to onboard athletes and fans. And I know that the trouble that I went through to, and it's funny because now it's super easy. But when I when I tried to point based account and all this stuff. Like I almost gave up and it was like, you know, I, I, I was like, I can't give up on this. I have to just grind this out and figure it out. Cause there wasn't too many YouTube videos. Like, you know, I, it was, you know, I was reading stuff trying to figure it out. And, and I, like I said, I know the difficulty that I went through and you know, my dad, my dad got, got a meta mask. My brother got a meta mask. So for me is like, you know, I helped onboard them and you know, they're, they're just two people in this community and I, and I know people are struggling with it as well. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to help. And I think the fans are the, are the most, are your, your onboarding fans, you're giving them access to athlete. And I think that's something that hasn't been done yet. Not necessarily on the NFT side, but you know, in the, the physical side as well, like how athlete, like you really can't, you can't like, go talk to them about their workout. You can't really do that. And I feel like what these guys are presenting is the ability to do that. And it's, it's super easy. Like there's a lot of people who don't want to be in person or talk face to face and like how easy is it to be on a podcast or, you know, just texting answers back and forth. And I, I think that's what the, what med athletes guys are doing is they're given, you know, accessibility to these athletes and it's going to be super easy for the athlete to like respond, which is which makes it even even cooler. You know, it's it's super easy to send a text message. We're all on our phones anyway, so it's not like 
a big deal for us to kind of like answer questions. No, I, lo- I love that, Matt. And I'm super excited to have you on the team. I, I feel, you know, the, as soon as I, you know, heard about the the project and the more, you know, I got to know uh, Drew and Kevin, of course, Drew, you know, is my business partner here and as the producer of the podcast and, and handles all of our, you know, all, all of our partnerships and all of our, our sponsorships here around this uh, space, you know, excited for the drop, um, you know, meta athletes, I'll, I'll put the link here in the show notes. Uh, we'll have more on that kind of leading up to the white list, which will happen uh, near the closer to the end of, of the month. And uh, you know, the, the, those that are, you know, being a part of the team, I know many of them are here uh, listening to the Twitter space, you know, as we record as well, uh, exciting things ahead. And I think, you know, more just another, you know, uh, opportunities for us to kind of push forward. Uh, you know, this podcast also have, you know, I love, you know, being able to record these live because I also get to have uh, some of the community jump in. And I got a couple questions from uh, people in the community that were asking about, you know, choosing the the place for your art as an artist. You know, you mentioned the Nifty Gateway Drop. Uh, we we shared the link for your, your super rare collection. Uh, is there a process like wh- why you select which one or how would you recommend, you know, the one of one artists that are listening to this to to think about the, the platforms that they're actually hosting their, you know, their NFT art on? Yeah, dude, I feel like this is the, the biggest conflict in our where to mint, how to mint. And I think there's benefits, there's pros and cons to everything. Um, you know, I just had this conversation yesterday because, you know, I was, as you guys know, I, I'm coming out with a series and it's called the Walk Off Series. And the series is going to be, you know, nine, nine different pieces with nine different artists, other artists you know, to represent nine innings and the ability to do, you know, extra inning pieces. And, you know, me, it was like tough. Like, do I, do I mint on super rare or I mint my own contract? Like, you know, I feel like I've built my, my following and, and my collector base pretty solid. So I have the ability to kind of reach out to these guys like, Hey, listen, um, I'm putting out a series. Would you be interested in taking a look? If not, no. And that's what I usually say. You know, I don't chill. Uh, you know, if they want to see it, then I'll, then I'll show them my piece. But, but if not, then I just kind of like keep it to myself and just post on online. But, you know, I, I feel like if, uh, if you're an artist kind of like entering this space, the best thing is to get on these, these platforms because they have, they already have their, their collector base on there. Like super rare has their collector base, you know, foundation has their collector base. Nifty gateway has their collector base. So, so I feel like once you, you know, put out, you know, quality, consistent work, then you build your collector base, then you really don't need those platforms. But they're still good to have because there's, like I said, I always meant on Super Rare. They gave me the opportunity and and, and I, I love the guys over there. I just felt like that for for this series, I wanted to do my own contract and I just kind of wanted to test it out. And if there was any, any time that I should do my own contract, it was probably, you know, for a series like this. But, you know, if, if I was coming into the space as an artist, I would try and get on a platform because they already have, you know, those those collectors that are already built in the system because of the fact that they've been collecting for two, three, four or five years. What, do you have any like uh, like takeaways or like lessons learned from doing that your own contract? Was there things that like about it that surprised you or things that you were you know, kind of excited to see that how that works. I'm, I think that's always an interesting, you know, experiment because we, we did that here with the, with the podcast as well. And uh, I know there's many of listeners, we, we have a little bit less than a hundred of our, our super fans, uh, NFTs uh, left for purchase that they give people a, a piece of the pie when we sell our, our full collection uh, in November. But I'm curious, like how did, how did you, was there anything that jumped out? Any lessons learned that you had, you know, doing that on your own? I mean, I think the biggest thing that I, I've talked with collectors about is like provenance and ownership you know if, i know nifty gateway was kind of going through that a while ago about you know like what happens is our server go down well if their servers go down there's like nothing you can do those pieces are pretty much lost forever you know and and another thing i was on um i was on a space yesterday with uh, roger roger dickerman RD, and um i guess there's been some x copies that he he minted early early on on a platform and the platform just kind of like went away and and you know, those, those X copy pieces are gone forever. So I feel like the, the contract, the, the benefits, the pros of the contract is the provenance, is the ownership. And, you know, like, I, I just, that, that's pretty much what I learned. You know, I, I, I think that, yeah, super rare and foundation, all these, all these platforms have a ton of collectors and, and they're great, but, you know, 
I don't know. I just I just felt like it. I I needed to to do it on my own contract at least for this series. All right. So as we pull this, wrap this up. You know, I really appreciate your you know your time. Love you know every aspect of your story. Excited uh, to have you with Meta Athletes, and and we'll be able to do some things together. Uh, you know, moving forward. I'm curious. Is there a, you know a painting or an NFT that you're working on right now? Is there anything like currently in the works that you can share? Um, I just posted something yesterday, and and one of the things I was telling Kevin. Um, was, you know, like I really try and, and paint like kind of what's going on in the situation right now. Like yesterday, I don't know if you can filter through my tweets. I did. Um, it was my skeleton with a gas, a gas nozzle to his head. And my caption was gas me up. And, you know, you, you can take that any way you want. And I told Kev, I was like, yo, like the reason why I painted this is because like, I wanted to resemble like gas, like gas is killing us right now. As far as like, if you're driving, if you're a freaking, if you're a truck driver, like gas is killing you. If you're commuting to work every day, gas is killing you. And that's, that's what I, I wanted to depict, you know, the gas prices go up. So, you know, as far as like, like working on stuff, I'm always trying to like watch CNN or watch the news, watch Fox news, just trying to think of, you know, stuff that I can paint. That's, that's relative and that, that everybody can relate to. I love that. And I, I actually tweeted out this morning before I, I didn't even see that. And I just said, uh, you know, gas, gas in, in, in real life and gas in Web3. I don't think anyone likes either one of those being high prices. Right. So it's a, uh, definitely an interesting world. Uh, Matt, thanks so much for being a part of this. I'm going to put all of your notes and links um, in the show notes. Uh, any final words for the audience? Anything you want to leave us with? No, man, I, I appreciate, you know, being on the podcast and, you know, it was awesome talking to you and, and sharing my story and, and my love and passion for it. because of this series that I have coming out. Like I, I want it to be kind of a desirable series. And so I, I feel like I just, I create every day. So, you know, I, I always just kind of tease things. And if, if it resonates with somebody and they're like, Hey, you know, are you going to mint that? Then, then we'll do like a behind the scenes sale. Um, but for me, dude, I'm, I'm really super focused on this, on this retirement series, the walk off series. So that's, that is like my plan to like mint those and, and yeah, I'll, I'll post from in, you know, some here and there, but you know, for me, it's just like this walk off series is it for me this year. And, and, and the walk off series, when's it drop? What's, I don't think we covered that on the podcast, but when's that drop? Yeah, no, the, the, that's, that's the retirement series. I, I, I made the name, the walk to kind of like, you know, I'm walking off the field. I'm, you know, see, see you later and walk off, walk off hit. It's all relative. You know, I just wanted to try and, keep it like baseball related honestly nice and there's not there's nine pieces fans though the first one was the one that was just released and uh it was 15 ETH, right matt is what it ended up yeah uh, yeah it's amazing man so there's gonna be eight other artists that are collaborating with you on these pieces right correct yep so that's that's what's to look forward fans though is um you know these pieces are going to be spaced out and and in collaboration with other og and, and other significant artists in the space so uh, I really look forward to it. Amazing episode, guys. Like this was, it was, <laughs> I just was fully dialed in and tuned in for the whole time. So um, awesome job. And I look forward to getting this out to everybody else. Well, you know what I just did really well was that when Drew said, hey, actually, I do have a question. I jumped across my table and pounded that record button so that we could capture this for the podcast episode since I'd already turned the recording off. So I got this in there. And Matt, I actually had one last question for you. You know, as someone that, you know, I don't buy a lot of things on, uh, you know, Super Rare or uh, the platforms. And I know some of them, you know, you make offers. Uh, what is like, how does it, because like you can see some of the history of the offers. Like, is there, is there like a format? Like what, I mean, I guess there's like, when we're looking at that, if we see others offers that are, you know, for a certain amount, the, the assumption is that we have to offer more than what that, you know, offers were before that weren't accepted. Is that, is that kind of how that works over there? Yeah. Yep. Exactly. I mean, there's, there's multiple ways to do it. You can do it. You can set an auction. Like I can set a reserve price and, you know, once you hit the reserve, it's either reserve buy and get it or it's a reserve auction and, you know, the reserve kicks off a 24 hour auction or, you know, you, you don't set a reserve and, you know, someone can offer you something. You can either take it or, or leave it. All right, sweet. Uh, I, that was definitely a personal ask because uh, the, the the home run king is on my uh, on my radar, and I have that make offer make an offer button right there in front of me. So, well, thank you for for coming in, and you know, and I will say, you know, 
on, on behalf of like the NFT community, uh, and I don't speak on behalf of them, but I will say on behalf of them that you know we are excited. The more you know, great humans that are doing great things, that are are sharing their gifts with the world, that are being vulnerable, that are putting their stories out there. You know, the better this community will be as a whole. And you know, for everyone listening, I think you know the beauty of these interviews for me is that we not only get to tap into different perspectives and, and different per, you know, pers- you know, opportunities that, of how people kind of get into this NFT space, but I hope we also take these opportunities to, to share like, the lessons and the use cases outside of the world of Twitter, Discord, and Clubhouse. Because I believe you know, if, we, if we truly want to continue to grow this Web3 space and this NFT community and, and have you know, great people doing great things and you know, being able to remove the starving from the starving artists, being able to you know, amplify the voices that for far too long uh, have not had the seats at the table that they you know, damn well deserve. You know, we have to do our part by taking great stories like Matt's uh, to the, the public outside of these roles, right? When you're sitting at, you know, at the bar or on the airplane or maybe when you're sitting at a dinner table, you know, being able to share things kind of beyond you know, uh, an ape being sold for $4 million uh, you know, to a celebrity on TV, that's not very relatable. But the idea that we can be vulnerable, we can share our, our creative talents and, and ultimately you know, be rewarded and celebrated for something that for a long time many of us thought were a hobby – and now it can be a, a thing that not only puts you know food on the table, but also can you know bring you know inspiration, you know motivation uh, to those around the world. And, and let's face it, we need we need more opportunities to make you know bring in good people uh, doing good things. So you know, as always, my friends, thank you so much for listening and tuning in. Uh, until tomorrow, cheers.